Why don't we go ahead and begin with a prayer? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Direct, O Lord, all our actions by thy holy inspirations and carry them on by thy gracious assistance so that every prayer and work of ours may begin from thee and by thee be happily in it through Christ our Lord. Amen. Mary, Queen of the Angels, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The topic is guardian angels, but before we really talk about guardian angels, it's important that people have a, a, a very sound understanding about angels in general and how, how our guardian angels fit in the scope of that. Of course, the church teaches us that the angels are entirely spiritual. They don't have a body. They're similar to God in that respect in the sense that they are purely spiritual. There is nothing physical about them. One of the common misperceptions that people have is, is that if you die in the state of grace, that you go to heaven and you become an angel. That's not the case. What happens is you become a disembodied spirit. You're somebody whose soul is in heaven, but you're not an angel, because an angel is someone who, by nature, is not designed to actually have a body. Then, of course, we get our bodies back at the final judgment. The angels... Um, are not purely simple like God. God is purely simple. There's no division within his substance. And so as a result of that, the angel, he, everything he does is that act of his own substance. So like when God wills or loves or things of this sort, it's his whole substance doing it. In angels, it's a different kind of a thing. They have an angelic substance, but then they also have an intellect and a will, which is distinct from that substance, very similar to us. Our intellect and our will are distinct from our body-soul composite, even though um, the brain is part of the, of the intellect. We'll talk a little bit more about that later because that becomes important. Um, they, uh, they have this intellect and will. Their mode of communication is that when one angel wants to talk to another angel, through his will, he prompts the other angel through a kind of a telepathy that he wants to communicate with him. Then once the other angel gives consent, then the concept that the other angel is thinking about is, is illumined into the mind of the other angel. So they speak directly mind to mind. That's how they communicate. One, the higher angels, because all angels are in a hierarchy, one angel, um, the higher angel can not only communicate the concept that he wants to talk, to, to discuss with the other angel, but he can empower the mind of the lower angel to grasp the concept to a greater degree than he would be able to by nature. Where they're at in the hierarchy is directly proportionate to how intelligent they are. So the more intelligent the angel is, the higher he is in the hierarchy. How much sanctifying grace they have at the moment in which they were created is directly proportionate to how intelligent they are that is directly proportionate to their substance. So in heaven, among the angels, the hierarchy of the angels is purely based on nature. And then, of course, the supernatural hierarchy of grace is proportionate to that in relationship to them. When some of them fell, when some of the angels fell, that left gaps in the hierarchy of nature, which will not be restored as far as its place in heaven. But what will be restored is the hierarchy of grace. So human beings will get those places of the angels who actually fell. The uh, demons, in fact, find that particularly revulsive, and, and they get very angry when they find out who's getting their place. So that's just to kind of keep that in mind. The angels were infused with all of the essences of created things at the moment of their creation. So as soon as they were created, God also infused in them everything all the essences of all created things, what the essence of a tree is, a human being is, what a dog is, what, what the, all the different angels are, because each angel has a different essence. In, each one is a different species. In fact, when you deal with um, angels, one of the things that you'll discover is their personalities, because each angel is essentially different from another one, their personalities are far more distinct than ours, and so you, the impression you get from one is very, very distinct than it is from another. Their personalities come through a much more clearly than human personalities, and part of that has to do with the fact that because our personalities are affected by our material dispositions, our bodies, thou, those are less distinct than things that are spiritual. So their personalities are much more distinct, much more defined than ours. Um, but they're infused with all of that knowledge instantaneously. What they don't have 
is all of the particular things that are going to happen historically. That God infuses in them as, the, as it occurs. That's their basic way in which they understand and know things. So they'll think of a concept like um, um, man, and then within that, they can focus their intellect on particular human beings and what they're doing at this particular time. That's how they grasp things and know things. We operate the opposite. We get a number of different individuals, and from that, we abstract the concept of what it means to be a human being. Okay, so their mode of knowing or how they understand things is the exact opposite. What that means is, is concretely, is that angels, as soon as they think about the concept that they want to think about, they fully exhaust everything there is to know about that concept instantaneously to the degree of their knowledge. They don't have to sit there and think things through and try and figure things out. The only thing they're trying to figure out is the economy of grace. Now, the angels in heaven just wait until God reveals it. But the economy of grace is what God's providential plan is regarding sanctifying grace and actual grace in the lives of human beings. They don't have access to that. The flow of history, they don't have access to that until it actually happens. Now, they can kind of see causation much better than us, so they, because they have all these particulars in their mind of what's going to happen, they can slowly figure out, okay, look, it looks like it's heading this direction, right? So one time I had a demon tell me in, in 2007, he said, things are really going to start heating up in 2009 because they, can see, they could see the trajectory of where things were headed. That all being said, um, so they, that's how they actually understand these conceptual things. But the angels, especially even demons, find it frustrating that they don't, uh, not the good angels because they, they're happy to, be revealed to them what is revealed to them at the time but the demons find it particularly frustrating that they don't know what what graces God's going to give to particular individuals that's always an unknown to them and that's why they're paying attention very closely sometimes they know that a person has a specific grace by the effects of that grace so they might know that someone has a particular um, grace that gives them a particular talent or capacity to do something by the way the person's behaving sometimes that means they'll actually go and target them but they understand those particulars. And so all of the particulars of everything that's happening in the entire universe at this particular time is being infused in their intellect as it happens. So if they want to know what's going on on Pluto, all they have to do is just move the, their will, moves the intellect to look to focus on the concept of Pluto, and then they see what's happening in Pluto. That's, what, that's how they think. Their communication with us is a little bit different um, because of God's permission, the angels can communicate to us without our consent at times. It's up to God to determine it. Because we don't have the kind of relationship they have where they can just communicate back and forth, God is the one who determines, God's the one who determines how, um, determines when they can actually communicate to us and how do they do that. They don't communicate to us conceptually. They don't infuse in us the concept of what it means to hu be a human being. Instead, what they're allowed to do is take information from your, ma from your memory, use that information to form an image in your mind, and then when, you're, when you look at it to make a judgment about that image, that image, how it's prepackaged, will tell you what they want to, you to know or to understand. One other thing they can do is they can empower your intellect to uh, have a greater grasp of the thing that you're looking at in your imagination. They can help you with that. But they don't communicate you, to you directly the conceptual knowledge, just the image. That becomes really important because that's actually how our guardian angels communicate with us all the time. They'll put in us imagery that actually helps us to do the right thing. The demons, of course, do the opposite. They'll go back into your, um, into your memory, take out the things, and use those to tempt you or to formulate images to tempt you in relationship to this. This is one of the reasons why I tell people uh, custody of the mind and custody of the senses, like your eyes, is extremely important because as soon as you see something and it's in your memory, even if you forget it, the demons can still make use of it. And so they can actually uh, use information that you, know, that you might have forgotten. This is one of the reasons why I tell guys never view pornography, period because that means those things could be used in your imagination. It's the same thing with watching certain kinds of movies that scar our imagination because then the demons can use that information to upset us and to affect us, etc. Okay, so this hierarchy of angels is based upon their intelligence. Again, 
their ability to communicate with us is determined by God. God tells them what, um, what they can communicate. So he determines every single aspect, even relationship to demons, but also all on the side of the angels. He determines exactly what they can and cannot communicate and the degree of uh, involvement in our life, except with one other thing, which we'll talk about a little bit later, how you get your guardian angel more involved in your life. The guardian angel, um, the uh, God makes that determination because it's God who's the one who's trying to determine the flow of your life. So even when demons tempt you, what they tempt you with is purely determined by God, purely. The degree of the temptation, how strong it is, what the content is, absolutely every aspect of it is determined by God, so they can't do that. But when they communicate that to us, those images to us, there's that initial communication that happens. That's the prompting that I mentioned. That's similar to the prompting that one angel gives to another that he wants to communicate. That's the prompting. It's up to you to determine whether you're going to continue that or not. Both whether on the side of the guardian angel, because sometimes people will get promptings to do the right thing, like, hey, go pray, now would be a good time to go pray. And the person's like, mm, I'd rather watch TV, right? So there's that, that prompting, and it's up to you to determine whether you're going to follow that prompting. Sometimes people ask me, you know, do demons actually know what's in our mind? They can surmise it. It's the same thing with the angels. They don't have direct access to what's in our mind. But they can probably figure it out based upon your bodily reactions. And this is what we're discovering in modern science. So, for example, when people lie, the, eye, the area around their eyes begins to heat up. There are certain physiological reactions to certain kinds of thoughts. And the demons are very perspicacious to those, and they can watch those. And then once they see there's that change, they can say, okay, he's probably thinking about this. The other way they can know is if they put a thought into your mind and then you accept it, they, and the fact that they're guiding it, they know that's what you're thinking. So those are the two ways that they actually know. And that also pertains to the guardian angels as well. They can prompt you, give you a thought, and if you accept it, and they, help, they can help you guide it. A lot of times people will say to me, how come I only hear or see about bad angels all the time? You know, you, you'll, see that, you'll see that people become possessed or obsessed or there's all these things happening in people's lives and you hear about demons appearing in the haunted houses and all this, but you, never, you rarely hear about angels. It has to do with our relationship with the respective angels. Human beings, the goal... Well, let's just back up a little bit. There's a phrase in scholastic theology that grace builds on nature. And what that means is is that God designed human nature a specific way, and when he gives us grace, it's to work in accord with that nature. What's our nature? An understanding, freely volitional being, right? So when God gives us a grace, it enlightens the mind and strengthens the will. And in a certain sense, some graces we get almost seem natural to us, like they're just part of us. When good angels act upon us and infuse things into our, you know, give us imagery and things like that, the promptings are done in such a way that a lot of times it's impossible for us to distinguish between what's for us from us and what's from them. And because their goal is to get us to act no, more according to our nature, that is a rational human being, because that's their um, primary, that's one of their primary goals, very often it just seems natural to us. And so what does this tell us? If you're functioning normally, that's probably a sign your guardian angel is pretty active in the background, helping you out and keeping you protected. If you're not, it's a sign he's probably not, because demons do the opposite. Their goal is to afflict you and make you make your life miserable and get you to the point where you lose self-control, uh, you lose your rationality, etc. That's their goal. So it's the opposite. And because of our nature, things that are in accord with our nature just seem natural to us, so we notice them less. The opposite is the case that when demons act upon us, we're much more sensitive to it when we feel miserable or things like that happen. So that's one of the things. So what does this tell you? It tells you that the guardian angels are probably far more active in your life than you even realize. And that actually brings up a real uh, interesting observation. How many people actually pray to their guardian angel every day here? Okay. How many of you develop a constant communication with him? Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay. Did you ever hear the story about Padre Pio and his guardian angel when he was 10 years old? Some of you might have heard of it. Okay, this is what happened. A boy in the village where Padre Pio was living got lost, right? 
And he was, Padre Pio was playing, and they said, well, you know, why don't you come help us try and find this? And he says, well, why don't you just ask your guardian angel? And they looked at him funny, so he just turned to his guardian angel and says, where is he at? His guardian angel tells him, and he says, well, they're over there. He's over here. So they go there, and they find the kid. That was the first time, 10 years old, it was the first time that Padre Pio didn't know that everyone else saw their, didn't see their guardian angel. He saw his guardian angel the whole time. He used to even chastise him when he would get beat up by Satan. He was like, where were you? Right? So, but again, that comes back to God determines it, right? Even our guardian angels can't do things unless we, unless God allows it. But there's one other time in which they, they, do, they are allowed. How much involvement your guardian angel has in your life, aside from what God allows, is directly proportionate, other than, again, what God allows, to how involved you get him in your life. If your complaint is that your guardian angel isn't helping you very much, just go stand in the mirror to look for the cause. Because the fact is, is that if you were praying to him more, he would be able to communicate with you more, you would be empowering him more by asking him to help you, asking him to give you this enlightening, this understanding. You'd empower him to actually help you more. If you never pay any attention to him, he's just not going to be able to help you very much. Because your relationship with him is largely on your side. He's willing to be completely involved in your life, but how much you're, he's involved in your life is really up to you. Unfortunately, most people don't hardly pay any attention to their guardian angel. So then people ask, well, which guardian angel, you know, where is my guy in this hierarchy? Because there's nine level, there's nine hierarchy, or nine um, ranks, nine choirs of angels. And, of course, it starts with seraphim, cherubim, and it goes down all the way to um, archangels and angels. Those are the two at the bottom. All of the guardian angels of particular individuals are taken from the rank of angels. Now, sometimes people ask, well, how many angels are there? And I'm like, a lot. <laughs> if you think about it, there's a, there's a different guardian angel for every single person, human person, that's been conceived historically. So you're talking literally billions. The authors used to say that 99% of creation that God made is non-visible. That is, it's the spiritual side of things. So that's just at the lowest hierarchy. Then you've got the archangels, etc. You go all the way up until you get to the top. So you're talking about billions and billions, and God created that entire hierarchy together at once, instantaneously, boom. So then people say, okay, well, wait a minute. If there's a hierarchy, then that means one guy gets a higher angel than another. This is true. Now remember that every angel is, di is essentially different from another one. So they're, the angels are as distinct as grasshoppers are from cows, from human beings, from dogs. They're that, they're that different from each other. And what God places in the angels when they're first created is not just the knowledge. So there's what they call the three instances. Some of you might have heard me talk about this. And I want to go into this because it's really important to understand your relationship with the guardian angel on his side. There's three instances into the angels. The first is, is that God created them in an instantaneous act of knowing. So instantaneously, they grasped who they are, that they were created by God, and that he had designed them, he created them for a specific task. And part of that task is ingrained in their very nature. So that a guardian angel has a distinct nature than, say, some other angel whose um, function it is to oversee a particular event, like, say, St. Gabriel or something like that. So there is... A particular, there's a particular set of inclinations. God designs the angels specifically for the tasks that they were given. Now, what this means is, is that your guardian angel was actually created specifically for you. That's what God did. He went out of his way to create something above you for you. That's what he did. So that's what the angel is presented with. Boom, this is your task, to take care of this particular individual. The second instance is they make their choice. Are they going to accept it or not? Inevitably, someone always asks me, well, what happened if my guardian angel didn't accept? I'm like, you're out of luck. No, it's not true. God assigns a different one. Okay, so the point is, is that uh, I've always wanted to say to somebody, that explains why you're so bad. No, but anyway. Okay, so God creates the guardian angel. He makes his choice. And then if he chooses to do the will of God, he enters into the third instances, which is immediately sees the beatific vision, and he's rewarded immediately, or he's damned immediately and experiences pain of loss immediately. There's no, 
I mean, there's a popular myth going around out there that there was this battle that ensued and they all kind of stood around and, well, am I going to make this choice? That's not at all how angels work. They make their choice because they have full instantaneous grasp of everything there is to know about a particular concept instantaneously. When they make that choice, it's a permanent, one-time, full-blown decision, period. That's why there's no changing to come back. You'll even talk to, to, to demons, you know, okay, so you, you chose not to follow the will of God, yes. And that was unwise, yes. It was very stupid, yes. And it's causing you all this pain, yes. You knew about this pain, yes. Would you choose it again, yes. You would think, okay, now human beings would say, eh, it's not so good, I'm going to try something else. But they can't because their will is locked in that choice that they have. Okay, now back up to your guardian angel's choice. You have a guardian angel, right? And he made the choice to accept God's will to, to watch over you. The definition of love is willing the good of another. That's the definition of love, to will the good of another. To protect and watch over and to care for somebody and enlighten them is a good thing, which means that the first choice that your guardian angel made was to love you. That was his first choice. Now, obviously he's loving God through you, but that was his first choice. So on his side, there's only love and only a desire for your salvation, a desire for your, your intellectual and your spiritual well-being, and a desire, there's actually not a desire because they don't have desires in the proper sense, but, but they would like to see a much more intimate relationship with you based upon your giving them yourself more over to them and guiding, being guided by them. And so this is something that's very important to recognize he loves you, he's there, He's trying to help you. His first choice was to love you. He's doing everything he can that God will permit. For you, you need to empower him more. But so where is he at in this hierarchy? It depends on what God's will is for you in your life. Who God assigns you, which angel he assigns you, is, deter is determined on what his particular will is for your life. Your guardian angel is given some knowledge about your life at the moment in which he chooses you. So uh, angels have actually said that because they were made for Our Lady, they were given knowledge about her life before she was even created. So, and that's the same thing in relationship to your guardian angel. He was given the knowledge of what your role was going to end up being in life and whether they were going to accept that, whether it's someone very high up in government or in the church or what have you, which probably means you have a higher angel because you need it, not because there's something special about you, but because you need it. But, and then... Some people who get the lowest guard of angels, some people probably think, well, my guy doesn't do too much, but he must be pretty down there pretty far. No, that's not the case. It could just be he's doing more for you than you actually realize, which is actually more often than not. So he's somewhere in that, in the, uh, in that hierarchy of angels. It is a common opinion of exorcists, based upon our experience, that Satan also assigned you a guardian demon. If your guardian angel fell, it's more than likely he's the guy that's assigned to you. If it's not, then he assigns someone else. And they know, both the angels and the demons know, just by looking at your DNA structure at the time of your conception, what your dispositions are going to be, which means what you're going to be inclined towards, what probably difficulties you're going to struggle with in life, whether it's going to be chastity or food or anger or things of this sort. They're going to have a general sense of that, okay, we can see where this is kind of headed based upon the person's disposition. So the angels know. They know us far better than we do. One of the most effective things that you can do is ask your guardian angel, you know, if you're going to advance in holiness, you have to know what your defects are, what your problems are, where you need to go in your spiritual life. Your guardian angel knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what your problems are. And so you can actually ask him, reveal to me what I need to know. What is my predominant defect? You can also ask Our Lady of Sorrows. But if you ask your guardian angel, he'll, he'll, he'll show it to you. The other thing is because um, sanctified perfection is directly proportionate to how much humility you have, one of the most effective things that you can do for a Lenten practice, or just do it all the time, you can go, you can actually have a Lenten practice where you ask your guardian angel, humiliate me interiorly every day for Lent. That all, that all, that's all you have to do for your Lenten practice. I guarantee you, it'll be one of the most fruitful Lents you will ever have in your life. Because they love to humiliate us, not in the sense of, you know, laughing at us, etc., but because they know in our lowering of our estimation of ourselves, 
It's more in congruity with the reality of what they are. They have to deal, your guardian angel has to deal with your arrogance, your pride, your obnoxiousness all the time, right? So this is something that you might want to consider doing, asking him, humiliate me interiorly. And usually what that'll come in, it'll just come all of a sudden, I mean, you'll just be standing next to people all of a sudden, boom, you'll just get this grace to see yourself and how you interact with people in your life. Oh, man, it's just, you know, there's pride there, there's pride here, and it gives a real clarity. It's not going to be, it's going to be painful, but if you're willing to embrace it, it's a good thing. Okay, so this hierarchy. Some people ask, because uh, they've heard, well, I've heard that if you become a priest, you get another guardian angel. Uh, this is the common opinion. And it's actually my own personal experience. I had, did have a case where um, I couldn't assist a particular individual, and I asked my guardian angel to go and assist the person. Um, and um, later I was able to contact them and uh, because they were being uh, attacked diabolically. I got the demons to leave her alone. And then she asked, did you send the guardian angel to the priesthood? I never told her. And she said, I said, yes, how did you know? She said, because he appeared to me and held my hand during the ordeal. So the guardian angel of the priesthood, and which guardian angel you get in your priesthood is directly proportionate to what God has intended for you. So someone asked her, well, what did he look like? She said, I don't know, but he was really big. So then someone asked me, how come you get a big angel? I said, because I'm really small. <laughs> so, but anyway. Um, but anyway, the point is, is that when you're ordained a deacon and then a priest, you're actually given another angel to guide your to guide your priesthood and to protect it. That's what it's actually there for. So you actually have two. In families, it's the common opinion of uh, theologians that when a, when the marriage becomes sacramentally valid, when people become married, God consigns another guardian angel to the marriage. So that there's actually a guardian angel of the family. So you can actually ask your guardian angel of your family to protect us, etc., and call upon him to actually protect your children, especially when they go away to college or school or what have you. Some people will also notice the fact that, you know, our family seems to be afflicted by a common demon, and that is very often true. They're called generational spirits. It usually results in somebody somewhere in the generational line committing a great big sin, usually one of the fathers in the family. It gets into the family, it starts afflicting the family, and then it gets passed through temptation and other means from generation to generation. And so you can have people in families where people think, oh, it's just genetic. Well, it may not be genetic. It could actually just be that they have a common demon that's afflicting them. So... You can actually um, ask Our Lady of Sorrows to reveal what the guardian angel of, uh, what, the, um, what the generational spirit of your family is, the, the evil one. One of the common things that was done a few years back was that people would name their guardian angel. And the Vatican came out and said, no, you are not to name your guardian angel. And there's a specific reason for this. First of all, you don't know. I mean, some of the names I've heard people give their, my, my guardian name is Fred. Okay, you know. Well, I like calling him, you know, and you're just like, what do people come up with this stuff, right? Um, why can't you name your guardian angel? It's very simple. We see it played out right in Genesis. In the book of Genesis, God brought all the animals to him to be named because Adam had authority over the animals. It's the same reason why parents get the right to name their children because they have authority over their children. In fact, for a child to later change their name without a sufficient reason is considered a sin of impiety. That is, it's against the proper honor that they're supposed to be showing to their parents. Right? So, this, um, so the reason you don't name your guardian angel is you have no authority over your guardian angel. And so it's not your place to name him. His name is already predetermined. God, in creating him, his nature is his name. And so the conceptual concept that one angel has of another one is the actual name that they, that they actually have. Now, when they formulate it for us, it's some type of verbal thing. So like Michael is, you know, he was like God, is that's what it actually means. There's a specific aspect to his nature that indicates that, right? And so that's why the church has said we only are certain about three of the angels, that is, Michael... Uh, Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael as, as far as the good angels. On the side of the bad angels, we know plenty. But on the other side of the good, we just don't know that many. But to name your angel is to do is, to, is actually a sin of usurpation. You're assuming an authority you do not have. And so I tell people, look, don't do that. Quit calling him Fred. 
you know. I imagine his name is a little more dignified than that. Okay. So, then there are also not only guardian angels of uh, people, of course, each individual has one. Then each family has one. The priests and deacons have one. Bishops, it's generally conceded the higher you go up in the hierarchy, each time you take a different step up, that a different guardian angel is assigned to you. So, um, you know, a, a bishop would have a higher angel than, say, a priest. It's just the general consensus. And this is obviously a necessary thing because the higher you go up, the more protection you need. There are also angels that protect specific buildings. Um, if a building is particularly important for the running of a country or something like that, God will consign an angel to that. There's guardian angels of regions, guardian angels of nations. There's a specific guardian angel for our nation. We don't know what his name is, but we know it's consigned. Why is he consigned? Because God has a specific intention about the history of that nation. He creates an angel specifically for that history in order to help us. Obviously, we're not relying on ours very much recently. Um, there's also guardian angels of individual churches. There's an actual guardian angel of the particular parish in which you're in, of the diocese. Um, there's also um, guardian angels of um, sometimes worldwide corporations or institutions. The God will assign a guardian angel to that. In other words, there's hordes of them that he created in order to have the governance of man um, properly ordered. And this is what we're tapping into. I think that most people fail to realize how intimately involved. If we could see what's going on spiritually, we would see that there's a lot more going on on the side of our angels and on the side of demons. There's a lot more going on the side of our angels than we actually ever would realize. It's unfortunate that people just don't make use of their guardian angel because he's there, he's wanting to help, and he can help you. Sometimes people do have even extraordinary experiences of their guardian angel. I know a priest one time who was driving down this road, and as he was driving down the road, he looked over on the other side of the road, and there was a, a emergency vehicle coming. And so he started to slow down to pull off, but as he looked up, the car in front of him had stopped, literally instantaneously stopped on the fr right in front of him, which meant he was going to plow right into the back of him. And all of a sudden, something grabbed the steering wheel, and it literally took him off just perfectly off into the ditch and back up onto the road. He didn't hit anything. And he said, I was not the guy moving it. So sometimes those things happen. Sometimes people are always looking for the extraordinary to happen with relationship with their guardian angels or those things, but don't look for that, because if you're looking for extraordinary, the demons will be happy to step in and take the place of it. Um, you can also ask your guardian angel to help you to combat the specific defects and to help you to, to, strengthen, your, um, to strengthen you. Not just, in the, and not just by giving you a better understanding of things, but you can even ask him to give you the right images so that you can guide your life more properly. Ask him to help you not to remember things, because they can actually block you from remembering things if you allow them. Um, you, can, you can ask him, help me to remember things. Help me to make the right associations. Help my emotional life. Because the angels can act upon our bodies, they can actually help. If, like, if you're really struggling with a really strong emotion like anger, then they can actually help to calm that anger down or suppress the bodily functions and cause that so that you're actually able to think more clearly. But they'll only do that if you just keep asking them and get them more and more involved in your life. Of course, you should be praying to your guardian angel every day. And you can also pray to the guardian angels of other people in your family um, or, as I mentioned, the parish or what have you in order to get the, uh, get the help that you actually need or your particular son. Some people have done this. I have yet to see that it works that much. I mean, I think it does on occasion, but people will tell their own guardian angel, go tell so-and-so's guardian angel to, do, uh, to tell their, their person to do X. And that's a legitimate mechanism, but it's really up to God to determine whether it's going to work or not. In my own personal experience, it doesn't really happen that much. So um, you have to kind of be careful with doing those kinds of things. Okay, that's just the basics about guardian angels. So I'm going to stop there, and then we can, if people have any questions. Yes? I'm just wondering what happens with um, contraception if a person is even allowed to be conceived? Mm -hmm. Do they have angels created for them? Yes. That's the general consensus. I mean, some of these things we, wouldn't, we won't know for sure until we get to heaven. 
So that's one of the reasons why, because some people ask, well, what happens with the child who's aborted? What happens with the guardian angel? Well, he goes back to heaven. He just spends his time contemplating God. That's his job after that. And it's the same thing with us. When we die, we'll meet him when we're, after our final judgment, provided we get to go to heaven. We'll meet him. And if we don't meet him then, we'll meet him at the general judgment. But we'll meet him um, in heaven. But after we die, he just gets to go to hang out. So his job's done. So. Yes, there are billions. But we just don't know their names. Yes. When you say when we die, we meet him Depends on how bad you've been. <laughs> yeah. Right. No. The general consensus is that there is not. Now. Are they? When you say they go to heaven and they're contemplating God, are they still receiving for you? Or they still no, not once you're in purgatory. The only people that can help you are on earth, so they can't help you there. But once you, after by by me by final judgment, I mean if you go straight to heaven, then you're going to get to actually meet your guardian angel. So um, if you at your at your at the general judgment, if you don't meet your guardian angel because you're damned at the general judgment, the fact that you didn't listen to his promptings at your at your at your general judgment. And at your final, too, at your particular, um, depending on how God decides to, to execute it, you will know all the individual promptings that he gave through your life and whether you accepted them or not. So you'll fully understand what he was trying to do and what he, whether it helped you. Now, if, you, if you're damned, it's pretty shameful because you're going to be looking at that. You'll hate him, but you'll feel shame because you didn't follow him. Yes? Uh, I have a, you know, a set of Yeah, those are all apocryphal. The church explicitly states they do not ver ver uh, verify those. Because it's based on a scriptural misinterpretation by the Protestants. So that's where it came from. That's where most of those come from. That's why the church doesn't authenticate them. I mean, there probably is some guy named Uriel, but may not be the guy that that they think is the guy in the Old Testament. So, so, so we still recognize uh, seven archangels? We well, there's actually more than seven archangels. If you're talking about seven, it's the, the only group of angels that were created that were seven were the seraphim. Is, uh, so Michael, Gabriel, and uh, Raphael are uh, they're archangels. They're archangels, yeah. How many others are there? Billions. Um, oh, it's also I should have mentioned that you know when I, they say that you get once you become a um, a priest or a bishop, you get a different angel. It's generally conceded that it's an archangel that's just consigned to. Um, the um, there was something I was going to mention about that. Uh, I'll, yes. I'm always confused. Why are the three? Archangel said, we know saint. I have related saint to being a human. Oh, yeah. Well, the reason they're called saint is saint just comes from the Latin word sanctus, which means holy. holy. They're holy. Um, so, just when you were asking that question, I remembered someone was going to mention about that, and I lost it again. Yeah. Um, a vast majority either comes from the Father. St. Thomas Aquinas is the one who did most of the synthesis, but a lot of his is based on um, Dionysius and a few other um, uh, fathers. Um, Gregory, St. Gregory the Great, wrote quite a bit on them. Um, then the church itself, some of the things. The, as far as the demon stuff goes, it's based on stuff that I've actually either read or personally experienced in dealing with them. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I think it does. Actually, I think some of them does. Well, of course, the names of the hierarchy of angels are right in Scripture, right? So that's where they get them. But what their are, what their function is, and where they fit, that is something that the uh, that Saint Gregory started parsing out, and it gets fully more developed by Saint Thomas. So, yes. Right 
No. All the angels are all in created instant. The entire hierarchy, all billions and billions of them, are created instantaneously in one instance. And at that instance, they were said, this person is going to live at this time with this name and with this function. That's Would you guard them? And then they say yes or no. And then they just wait around until you can show up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. Oh yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's kind of the same kind of a question. You know, if I fall asleep saying the rosary, will my guardian angel finish it? No. <laughs> so the other side of it is, the other side of it is, if you ask them to go be, you can't ask them to go ask something before God before they're thrown or before that. That 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 part is true in the sense of not. You can't ask them go be there for me. It's more a question. Go and ask God before the throne or at the blessed sacrament where He's exposed. That that they can do. Yeah, just to honor. Yes, they can do that. But the thing you have to remember is, the whole time he spends there, you don't get any of the merit except for the initial asking. Because some people have this idea that, oh, if I consign him there day in and day out, I'm going to get all this stuff. That's not how it works. <laughs> yes. Um, like when you do when you do uh, exorcisms, and how many spirits or how many angels evilly can stay remain in the body of the person? One of the questions I have sometimes is, uh, do angels, evil angels, says the body, says the soul. Hmm. Either it's the body or the soul of the mind, and see how many, how many angels, or people or angels, which call the mind, which call the body, which is the soul. Right. So when you do exorcisms, how long do you to out two, three, four, five, ten. Right. Right. Um, possession is of the body, not of the soul. They can't possess the. That's why a person can be in the state of grace. In fact, I know someone who's possessed who's extremely holy. So, it's in part. It, and um, the uh, so some so the possessions in the body and the soul. The number of possessors is based on a variety of different factors, but there can be more than one. I have had a case, and we even saw it in Scripture, right? Because the Christ said, you know, what is your name? And they said, we are legion, for we are many. And sometimes when, when you first are dealing with a possession case, the demon will say, you know, say, who are you? And he'll, he'll say, I'm legion. Yeah, 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 yeah. You all say that, right? <laughs> so, but, but I did have one case where there was legion. So, but, um, and it, it, how long it takes doesn't necessarily correspond to how many they got. It just depends on what God's plan is in getting them out. So it can be anywhere from one session to years, just depending on the case. Um, one of the things I was going to mention, and then I finally remembered it, one of the things that really humiliates Satan is the fact that he was the highest angel created. And when he fell, um, when he was cast out of heaven, he was cast out by someone of the rank of archangel. And so one of the things that really perturbs him is the humiliation in being cast out by someone so much lower in rank. The demons, the, the angels, their real concern, is, their, their real appreciation for people and for other angels is based upon the sanctifying grace, how holy they are, right? Whereas the fallen angels are, they still have that very strict sense of a pecking order based upon how hard you are in the nature of things. And because we're lower than them, they're very condescending. They're very obnoxious. And any demon that's below, or any, even an angel that's below them, when they're talking about them, they get very condescending about it because they're like, he's below me in the order of nature. Maybe, but at least he didn't make a foolish decision, you know. So, yes. Um, pray to get rid of him. No. Okay. Yeah, well, that's part of it. Uh, actually, Our Lady of Sorrows is when you pray for the generational spirits. Your predominant defect is what you want to pray to your guardian angel for. And to Our Lady of Sorrows. But to, to the, um, the, uh, 
pure garden angel free predominant defect. Once you discover what that spirit is, that will tell you probably how you're gonna get rid of him. So if it's like a spirit of anger or a spirit of pride, well then you gotta start working on humility and you have to ask our lady to cast him out, etc. Sometimes there's prayers that can be said to get rid of him. Sometimes you can go to a priest and have him do prayers to get rid of the particular generational spirit in the family. Um, and then what if we address our guardian angel? My, just my guardian angel. That's all you have to do. He knows who he is. Yeah. Um, most of the angels that fail, mm -hmm. what choir do they belong to most of them? Um, most of them, it's generally conceded that most of them belong to the lower ranks. So most of them came from the lower three ranks, but predominantly from the, the lowest rank angels. But Lucifer was in the first. He was, he was the top. He was the very top. Yes, he was the highest. Yeah. So, and then as you go down, the number that fell increased. That's the general consensus. Yes. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, no. The question is, do guardian angels have emotions? You know, so do they don't have emotions in the sense that we do, like getting angry and things like that. But what they do have is in their will, they have the same kinds of motions that we have in emotions. So, for example, in the will, the de like let's take a demon, for example. He can perceive some kind of an, the definition of anger is a perception of injury with a desire for vindication. So he perceives some kind of injury to himself that causes sorrow in his will, and then he, in his will, desires to give vindication against the person. So he does suffer a kind of anger in his will. But it's not the same kind of emotion, because emotion is a bodily thing, so they don't have that. However, so they have the gamut. They have delight, sorrow, joy, all those things in their will, um, and they're much more intense. You, than, than ours are. People have this false conception that somehow or another human beings have a much richer life because we have senses. It's completely the opposite. Their intellectual life is so vivid and so intense that it far outstrips any experience that we have of physical things. And so, because what's happening is, is we're judging angels based upon our own intellectual experience, which sometimes isn't very bright, right? That's not the case with them. It's, 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 it's the opposite. But on the other hand, too, that their delight in things is much more intense than ours. And you see this with demons. Their anger is much more intense. Their sorrow is much more intense because it's in the will. But they don't have emotions. We have a will because we make the choice. But we also have emotions. Yes, Father? Does an angel suffer? Yes. Uh, 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 feels pain because for the name of Mary and the name of Jesus. We name the names of our name and his name is the devil. Feels fear of those two names. Mm -hmm. But somehow. Uh, yeah, the pain, the pain is in their will. Intellectually, they're considering something that's true. By the way, demons cannot think of anything false, they can command things that are false. They can't think. Their knowledge is never false. So what happens is, is when they think about our Lord and our Lady like that, they're not like us who get confused and d misunderstand stuff. That's not how it works. What it is is when they, when they consider like our Lord and our Lady, the demons, that thought is present, it's in their intellect, and the will sees that. And then the will, the will, because of its choice, if it's a good angel, there's an automatic inclination to love that good thing if it's a bad angel, the will, because of its bad choice, turns away from it, and the presence of it to the will causes sorrow or pain. So, and it's much more intense than ours. I mean, I've heard demons scream in ways that Hollywood is absolutely incapable of reproducing. So, and when you see the degree of pain they're in. So, um, and you know, it gives you—it's a good thing because people give you. People have this idea that oh, hell's not so bad, you know. But it's—it's it's absolutely brutal. All people's understanding of it, like the Satanists, all these people—they say, oh, "I'm going to be powerful now." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're also going to be brutally miserable, and you're going to hate it. So. Um, Father, yes. if there's a generational sin or a demon coming down through the generations, does the like a generational mass? Okay. Yes, it can. You can have masses said to break any generational spirits being passed. Um, they call it sometimes healing the family tree, but that's a bit of a misnomer. You can't 
You can't heal the damage from the past. You can make reparation for it. Um, and you can also ask God to pray that some of the effects are mitigated in the subsequent generations. They can be freeze. Yes. Yes. That's right. Yes. So you said that you're going to tell us how to become better friends with your Okay, so, yes. One is getting more involved in your life. Ask him to help you. Help, help me with this. Help me with that. Help me with this. The other thing is when you go to study, hey, he already knows it all, so you can just ask him, hey, put me in here. I'm not getting this. And they can actually help you to study. You need to, um, you need to make acts of love to them, right, as a matter of charity, just like you would with God or Our Lady or things like that, or acts of devotion, just like you would saying the prayer to our guardian angel regularly. Um, but like I said, fostering that devotion to him because the more what devotion really is, St. Thomas says comes from the Latin word vovere, which means to vow, which means to subordinate yourself to them. So if you subordinate yourself more to your demon, the more you place yourself under him, the more he can help you. Um, thanking him regularly. I mean, God and angels and stuff, they're not that much different from us. I mean, if you, if, if you constantly give somebody, you're constantly have somebody, they're just constantly blowing you off, and they're not accepting anything, and, you know, and then you, they finally do take something, and then they never say thank you, you're going to say, man, this guy's just an, an great right? So the point is you have to be thankful to them and try and foster that relationship. Ask them to be with you all the time. Um, protect you. When you go to bed, ask them to keep you from having bad dreams or to guide your dreams or what happens if it's necessary. Um, you don't sit there and say, I would like a dream about chocolate. You know, you don't do that, but you can ask them, you know, guide my dreams if necessary. So, yes. Um, are there any prayers to um, besides the, the standard one? Uh, there's a few in the Recolta, if I remember correctly. Um, which is the Vatican collection of prayers that they used to have in the 30s. You can get them off them. All of those have been put on the internet, but you better be careful because you got to wade through some stuff on the internet because there's a lot of garbage about guardian angels and what they do and etc. There's a lot of garbage out there, so be very careful. So, yes. A while ago you said we're each given a guardian angel. You're, you said we're also given a guardian demon. Can you kind of explain that? What it is, is is that God loves to mimic, or sorry, Satan loves to mimic God and the Catholic Church, and etc. So he, he just, he mimics everything. So what he does is, is that very often, if God will allow the demon to be involved in your life, he'll assign a demon to afflict you um, in order to try and bring you down and to get you to lose your salvation. So, um, and sometimes... People have experience of that particular um, that particular demon, so but it's up to God to determine how how much he affects you, etc. So your reaction to to him is based on how much you spend on your guardian. Your guardian angel's not going to abandon you. If no, you have a never. Guardian demon. Okay. Right, right. Yeah. Oh no, no. In fact, he probably spends a lot of his time blocking the guy okay. um, and protecting you from him. On the other hand, sometimes God says, no, you have to allow this demon to, to tempt this person or what have you because this is necessary for their virtue. And so your guardian angel, like, or it could be that God will say, well, look, we're going to let, we're going to let this demon afflict this individual so that they'll start depending more on you, the guardian angel. So when you get to heaven, you'll know his real name. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can do that. I mean, I've seen, I know people who do that, and it works pretty well, actually. But, but you can't guarantee it. So I'd still have the alarm set. <laughs> okay. Because you don't want to be, you don't want to put your dirty little test. That's right. Yeah, and yeah, that's one thing you don't want to be doing is say, well, if you're really there, you know, Make my mom give me that iPod. You know, sorry. That means you don't do that. Okay, and now the other thing is, I know it's not a good idea to name your guardian angel, but I'm also wondering, you know, I'd be skeptical about the idea of trying to ask your guardian angel to reveal their name. Yeah, well, you can't because the problem is, okay, here's the problem with it. To ask your guardian angel what his name is, when, when, if... If there was some type of a communication that would come, 
you could never be assured that it was him or a demon. And that's why the church says, don't do it. So, and that's why all the saints say, you know, don't do it. Some people say, oh, I know what mine is. It's such and such. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You can't talk to anyone else's guardian angel. Yeah, you can. They're just like any other the saints. You can communicate with any of them. So, like, if you have a husband or your child, you know, the guardian angel of Bessie Sue, get her straightened out, right? And keep her from crying all through Mass. Um, you can ask for that. So the more devoted you are to him, the more likely he's going to do it. You can do both. Okay. Yeah. Get them involved. You want to get them involved as much as you can. The problem is, is through people's sin, they're getting all the demons involved rather than getting their angels involved. So, any other questions? Yes. I have three grandchildren, and Mary has been scattered around. Can we still, can we ask our guardians or guardians to even though they're white, say, in Colorado? Yes. Distance doesn't mean anything. An angel changes location. Angels, because they're not in a place, they don't have to change location. What changes with them is the effect of their, when they apply their will to something physical or creative, when they apply their will, it changes from one location to another. That's why, they, it, that's why they're actually depicted with wings, because they can, be a, they can be acting in one location and then also have been known to be acting in another location, so it looks like they're, they're, they flew there very quickly, but it's actually, they just change their will to that, and then it has an effect there. Yeah. I think we have one son like you communicate with the like that. Can we ask the guardian angel to make Yes. Yeah. You can pray to him. Keep asking him. Help, you know, enlighten his mind so they're not enlightened, but illuminate his mind so that he actually understands what he needs to do, what he needs to become, and give him the right images, give him the right emotions, because the demons, or the demons, the, they, them too, but the angels can actually incline you to have the right emotions at the right time, too. Yes. Another question related to the other one. We're talking about time. And uh, there are huge moves now of what's happening in the whole universe as right. it happens. Right. Uh, but we, we, and, and only God has knowledge outside of time. But we pray for the people of spouses, for the people of religious superiors, for our children. Right. If, if, uh, for the seminarian, for example, for his future guardian angel. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, yeah it has, should be convenient. Yeah. Would, would he be knowledgeable of that assignment from his creation? Yes, he would be. Uh, the thing to make sure, though, is, is that you don't know if someone's going to be ordained until the hands are on their head. So, um, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but, but so it should be conditional. If you're going to pray to their future, you know, peers or what have you, you should you should pray um, conditionally. You know, if this you know if this person is going to ordain guardian angel is consigned to that, I ask you to you know help them at this moment or what have you. Right. 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 Yeah, help them to guide them to find the right ones. That's another thing that's really good is asking the guardian angel of your children that they find the right spouse or discern their vocation properly. Yes? Does the church know um, if this is what guardian angels or what level guardian angels are mother and Mary? Uh, no. The only thing that we do know about that particular guardian angel is that he is represented um, symbolically in the Ark of the Covenant. So there's two different angels. One is representative of the, of the angels of Christ. The other one is the angel of Our Lady. So that's the only thing that we know symbolically. We don't know anything else more about him as a particular individual. So, of course, you'll have quite a bit of glory in heaven, I imagine. So, yes. It could be, yeah. 
Yeah, they all have distinct roles. I mean, it's a whole lecture in itself, but there's a, they all have distinct roles. I mean, you can get most of that, I think, right off of um, the uh, uh, Catholic Encyclopedia off the internet, but you can get that information off it. Sometimes the angels that are a bit higher in the hierarchy are assigned particular tasks that they normally wouldn't be assigned, but um, that's, uh, yeah, so that's, that can be, like I said, some angels are assigned to a particular individual, some are assigned to a particular event. So, so um, St. Gabriel, right, was consigned the event of announcing the, the birth of our Lord. So there's that, um, there's that particular function that he performs. Others are consigned to, say, maybe a particular event in human history to guide it and to help it. So, um, but in that particular case, that was, the, that was the angel who was consigned to that particular function. He was created for it. And it gives you an idea of the fact of how generous God is. You know, I like you so much, I'm going to make an angel for you. <laughs> okay, yes. Mm-hmm. Father, this is just kind of a question for you. When you are praying over someone who is possessed or something, do, you, do they reveal themselves to you? I mean, do you see to the them demons? physically with your eyes? Yeah. Yeah, you see it. Do you see, do, if you're praying over somebody who has something, someone who's possessed, and does the demon actually show himself? And the answer is yeah. That's actually one of the reasons you know. He has to show himself somehow, otherwise you don't know the person is possessed. So, I mean, there's psychological patterns. There's very distinct psychological patterns in someone who's possessed as opposed to someone who's psychologically ill. And you'll see those in people, but it's not until the demon reveals himself that you have sufficient grounds to go to the bishop to ask for faculties to begin the process of solemn exorcism. And then do you ask your guardian to help you forget what you just told? You said that you No, you know, I'm one of these guys that after I get done, I can go home and eat a pizza and watch TV. <laughs> you know, I just, I can just leave work at work. I mean, once in a while, something, once in a while, once in a while, something will, ha- it, it's, the ugly stuff doesn't impact me. It doesn't, because you just see so much of it. You know, I, I tell people being an exorcist is like being on the receiving end of a sewer pipe, right? But the beauty of the sewer pipe is every so often some woman's wedding ring comes floating down that sewer pipe. <laughs> so you're like, hey, there's a little pearl right there, right? So every so often you'll see something on a spiritual level that is so profound, you know, like it's happened to me about three times where something was revealed about Our Lady or about some other thing that leaves you a little stunned for a while, the beauty of it, the doctrine, you know, so, um, but, but the rest of the stuff, it's just, you know, I go home, I got work to do, or I got, you know, or, you know. <laughs> yeah, and one of the, part of it comes down to the fact that demons, one of their goals is to steal, they, they envy our lives, so they want to steal it from you, and you just refuse to allow them to take away the normalcy of your life. Okay. <laughs> I doubt it. No, I think I just got one guy. Now, you just have to, I mean, the primary protection comes from Christ. That's where the primary protection comes, and from Our Lady, but it comes from primarily from Him. So that's what you actually have to, that's what you actually have to rely on. And you know that He's protecting you. I mean, I have had, demon, one time this one demon just stopped during an exorcism. He looks at me in all seriousness. Of course, the person's completely manifested, so it's not the person saying it. And he just says, if you weren't being protected, I'd snap your neck. Well, you realize it's a true threat, but you're just at a certain level. There's a, on another level, you're just like, you don't pay any attention to that. Because what they're trying to do is dig into you psychologically to distract you. So you just don't pay attention to it. So um, sometimes when they'll try to do stuff like that, I, I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm a firm believer in um, you punish bad behavior. So when they do bad things, they just get punished for it. So sometimes, like, you'll apply a relic to them, and they'll try and grab the relic and throw it or something like that. And I'm like, okay, kiss it, you know. So reverence it. So you just you, you, you punish them because you don't, and you have to, I mean, sometimes they're like little kids, you know. They're testing the waters. And so they, they, they're, they're trying to see, okay, what's this guy really, what, how much can I get away with this guy? And I just don't let him get by with anything. Because otherwise, they'll keep pressing your buttons. So... Yes. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with the painting of the agony in the garden where the Jesus is resting on the angel mm-hmm. while he's praying. Mm-hmm. Is that more of a devotional thing than a real thing? Right. I think because of its, well, the church talks about what they call the monuments. And the monuments are 
things like churches and paintings and documents that embody the faith in some way or another. So, for example, one of the ways, one of the, one of the monuments that we know, for example, that Our Lady was at Pentecost is that from the various early pictures of Pentecost, she's picked it as being present. So that's because the faith of the people is manifest in that. So the fact that it's so common through history and that it's there, I would probably say um, yes. And if I remember correctly, there's actually, a, there's actually a part in scripture that says that the angel appeared to comfort him at, after the, at, right at the end. So, do we, do we know what angel that? <laughs> although, although that was a pretty great task to assigned. Hey, would you help the Son of God do this? Well, you betcha. <laughs> so, okay. All right. Why don't we stop there? Um, if you have any other questions, you can come up and ask me privately. Um, I won't ask you to kneel because of the floor, but uh, I'll give you a blessing. So, but if you want to kneel, you can kneel. Benedictio de omnipotentis, patris et filii, et spiritus sancti, descendit super vos et manet semper. Amen.